Meeting of the Board of Education for Baltimore County for December 19, 2017. I invite all of you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led this evening by Rob Maloney from Delaney High School. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to consider tonight's agenda. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Second. 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 All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Very good, the motion carries. Uh, the first item on our uh, substantive is a selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available uh, to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Uh, board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box by our student member, Josie, will uh, be the speakers for the evening. You'll have to forgive me, I won't be as good as Mr. Birch on this <laughs> score, but that's quite fine. Uh, the first speaker is Faith Smith. The second speaker is Sharon Seroff. Third is Fatine Bryce. Fourth is David Green. Fifth is Ricardo Ramsey. Sixth is Ms. Bergman. Seven, Elizabeth Hembling. Eight is Charlene Banky. Nine, Mr. Boschrone, Dr. Boschrone, excuse me. And the last is Cheryl Thim. Okay, well, as a first timer, you did a nice job. We got close. All right, next on our agenda is a uh, special order of business, and I invite uh, Principal Sue Hirschfeld and her team uh, to come forward and join Mrs. White and me. This is a, is that on? This is a special order of business, a resolution honoring West Towson Elementary School. Whereas West Towson Elementary School is one of only six schools from Maryland to be honored by the Maryland State Department of Education as a 2017-2018 Blue Ribbon School. And whereas the, this Baltimore County Elementary, Elementary School was selected based on rigorous state requirements for high achievement and dramatic improvement. And whereas West Towson Elementary School joins the roster of 23 other county schools that have earned this.
2017 expresses gratitude and sincere appreciation. Look at that. <laughs> sincere appreciation to the entire staff, student body, and community of West Towson Elementary School for their hard work, foresight, vision, and extraordinary efforts in achieving this milestone. So Is moved. There? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. But can I just give these to her and say she is the best leader and the best principal in the whole entire world? It's all about teamwork and putting kids first, and that's what all of you do every day. And that's what makes the difference. Thank you. Congratulations, West Southern. Big on enthusiasm. <laughs> Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer matters to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution process. I ask you to observe your three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. And I guess none of the West Towson people want to speak. <laughs> Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. I now first call on our advisory and stakeholder groups, and the first is Tabco's Abby Baton. A little quieter. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. I have spent much of the last three weeks working with other educators from various parts of the country. What I have found in my travels is public education is under attack in many areas, and the problems we face here in Baltimore County are evident all over the nation. Prescriptive fixes that don't address many of the underlying issues our students face are evident nationwide. Testing that doesn't accurately measure a student's knowledge, nor whether that student will be successful or not, has become the bellwether to measure success. These tests have proven harmful and frustrating for many of our students, and what is even worse is they are trying to measure the unmeasurable. The, educa the educators are the experts. We know what our students need to foster their learning. Our job is to help every student gain a true love of learning and to provide the tools students need in their tool belts to assist them in future learning. Teachers are ready to step up and take back our profession and infuse common sense solutions into our classrooms and schoolhouses. We can't do it alone. We know our partners in education are critical to make a difference and help us spread the word. I hereby challenge you, our school board members, and BCPS staff, as well as parents and the community, to help us make sure the necessary tools are in place in every one of our schools. That means we need appropriate curricula, books, paper and pencils, art materials, time for recess, and educating the whole child for starters. We need smaller class sizes so we can reach every single student. We need support staff and substitutes. We need the monetary resources necessary to make all this happen. We should not be skimping on our children. They are the future. I hope you all have a wonderful, restful holiday and return ready to make some of this a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber. Good evening. I'm Leslie Weber, the um, community, uh, communications chair for PTA Council of Baltimore County. Um, good evening, Dr. Uh, Ms. White, 
um, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, and, and Board of Ed. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. White and Dr. Cuellar for meeting with our President Jane Lee and me last week. We really do look forward to partnering with you to increase family involvement in our schools. Um, as we discussed at our meeting, National PTA's training resources offer innovative ideas on welcoming families into schools. One of the most creative ways is a simple way to switch things up by taking the school to the community um, for meetings, especially in areas where transportation is an issue for parents and guardians. We were happy to hear an update on community schools and wraparound services. Even if full services can't be offered, maybe we can work together to start offering some support for students and families in need as we've done through our Family School Partnership Committee. A number of schools are benefiting from community partnerships, including with the Lock Raven Network, to set up food pantries and uh, rooms with clothes, toiletries, and other necessities required by homeless and food insecure students. Backpack feeding programs and, and holiday adopt a family programs are also working at a number of schools. We just named a new diversity chair and have a new area vice president in the Northwest area, so filling these key positions on PTA Council will also increase our outreach. Um, just a couple reminders, the submission process for the National PTA's annual arts program, Reflections, is um, winding down. Submissions are due to PTA Council on January 4th. We invite everyone to our next general meeting on Thursday, January 25th at 7 p.m. at Cockeysville Middle School, and I'd like to say happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Interim Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and the Baltimore County Board of Education. I'm here to talk about how the Board of Education can help my paraeducators help your at-risk students. The population in Baltimore County is growing, and that's a good thing. Parents are entrusting their children to Baltimore County schools. Pictures of our students intently working independently in small groups on their devices are posted on our website. But what about the students that just don't get it or have given up trying to get it? Students that are having problems mastering their subject matter now have additional problems of trying to master the delivery system being used in the classroom. When the delivery method becomes the obstacle to learning the lesson, the at-risk student once again is left behind. One teacher in the room may be able to engage 30 or more motivated and capable students. But in the real world, kids come with all types of baggage and disabilities that prevent them from fully benefiting from their lessons. These kids find themselves falling further and further behind. Every adult in the room is a teacher, but when the adult has to back off because they don't have a real working knowledge of the device the student is using, the student sees rejection. The opportunity to help the student individualize their instruction is gone. When the teacher does not have a way to communicate the individualized learning objective they developed for the student before the para enters the room, then of what value is the objective to that student or the para assigned to help him or her? It just becomes another way of documenting student failure. Teachers and paraeducators in their classrooms need to be able to collaborate, not necessarily in the same room at the same time, but through the devices. These devices have become the major communication system in schools between administrators, teachers, among teachers, and between teachers and their students. Devices once used in, uh, in the libraries are now being removed from the buildings. They were supposed to be assigned to the paras, but are not. Paras need to know what a teacher is teaching and the best way to support the instruction before they walk into the classroom. In short, the teacher uses the device, the student uses the device. The para who is supposed to help the student should not only know how to use the device effectively, but be using it to communicate with students, teachers, 
and administrators. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's time for public comment, and our first public comment speaker is Faith Smith. Good evening. Good evening, Interim Superintendent White and members of the board. My name is Faith Smith. I am currently the treasurer of the Randallstown High School PTSA, but I am coming here as the proud parent of a Randallstown High School senior who has autism and with a first quarter marking period GPA of 3.50. Students with disabilities need consistency, support, and someone to advocate for them. The BCPS needs to fill the position of superintendent and Verlita White is the ideal candidate for the job. Verlita White grew up in the Baltimore County public school system as an, and is an outstanding representation of the best of BCPS as a proud graduate of Woodlawn High School and an accomplished administrator. Also as an accomplished administrator and a BCPS parent, Verlita White continues to be an outstanding advocate and representative of Baltimore County Schools and its families. She understands what all BCPS students need and knows what's in their best interest. Ms. White has effectively served as Chief Academic Officer for BCPS for several years. She uses her past experience as a BCPS teacher and administrator to guide the curriculum within the school system because she understands the needs at the ground level. Over the past few months, Verlita White has effectively served as interim Baltimore County School Superintendent. Under her leadership, the transition into the school year has been seamless. The parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High School are firmly against the efforts of some board members to use our hard-earned tax dollars to fund a national search for a superintendent when we have an ideal candidate in Verlita White. Why look for someone outside the school system who will come in and make changes just to mark their territory? Students, especially those with disabilities, need someone familiar with their needs and goals to reaffirm priorities set in place to assist them to succeed. Ms. White is that person to maintain that consistency. Ms. White also played a significant role in making sure that the voices of Randallstown parents, students, and staff were heard to ensure that we got a principal that was right for our school and committed to student success. That principal is Mr. Aubrey Brown, the BCPS Secondary 2017 Principal of the Year. Ms. White is a product of Baltimore County Public Schools with a proven track record of excellence. She has an outstanding relationship with the BCPS staff and community leaders with a clear understanding of the climate and the needs of Baltimore County. We, the parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High wholeheartedly urge the Board of Education to appoint the most qualified candidate to the role of superintendent, and that candidate is Verlita White. Thank you very much for your time and have a happy holiday. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, Interim Superintendent White, Board President Mr. Gillis, and uh, the rest of the board members. I am a parent advocate for special needs students in this county and several other counties. And I'm gonna give you two scenarios tonight that concern me greatly because these could be easily solved by people just doing their job and being willing to cooperate and work together with parents. First scenario is a student who has average to above average intelligence, but he seems oppositional, non-compliant in the classroom because he's not doing his work. But he, he can't read what he's seeing, but, but his teachers don't know that. And then the parent tells them, well, He's got a visual impairment. 
Nobody understands this impairment. Nobody is even willing to address the impairment even though they have evidence from the doctor. And when they're asked to provide solutions to this child's problem, they go, he's smart. He just needs to do his work. We have two ways to go here. One, take that student out of that school building and put him in a non-public school, which costs upwards of $45,000, $50,000 a year. Or we put a trained body in a classroom and find some one-on-one -on -one time more than a half an hour a week to work with that child. We also need to be willing to work with the parents when they ask for, I'd like to know how he's doing in the classroom. Can I have some raw data? Can I have a communication sheet that tells me what's going on in my son's classroom, or my daughter's classroom? I can tell you that in a lot of schools in Baltimore County, there is a lack of willingness to provide that raw data to parents. Parents are asked to trust administrators with their children, and, and these administrators are not willing to provide this data so that we know that our kids are actually making progress. I'm asked. Thank you, Ms. Aroff. Our next speaker is Faith Bryce. Good evening. My name is Faith Bryce. I'm a parent of two Randallstown High School students, a freshman and a senior. I'm also the president of the Randallstown High School PTSA. We, the parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High School wholeheartedly urge the Board of Education to appoint the most qualified candidate in the role of superintendent of Baltimore County. That candidate is Verlita White. Ms. White is a product of the Baltimore County Public Schools with a proven track record of excellence. She has an outstanding relationship with the Baltimore County Public St School staff and community leaders with a clear understanding of the climate needs of Baltimore County. The parents, students, and staff of Randallstown High School are firmly against the efforts of some board members to use our hard-earned taxpayer dollars to fund a national search for a superintendent when we have an ideal candidate in Verlita White. Over the past several months, Verlita White has effectively served as the interim Baltimore County School Superintendent. Under her leadership, the transition into the school year has been seamless. As an administrator and a Baltimore County public school parent, Verlita White continues to be an outstanding advocate and representative of the Baltimore County schools and its families. Ms. White has effectively served as the chief academic officer for Baltimore County public schools for several years. Ms. White uses her past experience as a Baltimore County public school teacher and administrator to guide the curriculum within the school system because she understands the needs at the ground level. Verlita White grew up in the Baltimore County public school system and is an outstanding representation of the Baltimore County Public School System and a proud graduate of Whitlawn High School. She's also a, an accomplished administrator. Ms. White has been instrumental in laying the groundwork for the STAT initiative and moving it forward to ensure that the use of technology is effectively balanced with instruction to ensure a competitive future for our students. Berlita White played a strategic role in reducing the minority graduation gap. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Green. Good evening. I'm here to talk about ethics. There's been a lot of talk about ethics lately, focusing on ERTI and tech vendors and people that are outsiders. I'd like to refocus that discussion a little bit on something, on things we have a little bit more control over. Uh, I'm specifically not here to talk about the interim superintendent. I don't think we should lay the sins of others on her, and she may be the best person to make needed changes to STAT. What I'd like to talk about is the ethics review panel. 
a, a year or two ago, the ethics review panel, their, their bios, there are five of them, there, were f there was a paragraph bio for each of them on the website. And now there are no bios. What we have is their names, and two of them we have a, a comma and Esquire after their names. Uh, so I guess we have two lawyers, and the, and the rest of them we, don't, we know nothing about. I know this because uh, a year or so ago I interviewed to, uh, with a couple of members of this board to become a member of, of that review, ethics review panel, and I had a discussion about a very serious controversy about eight or nine years ago, some of you may remember, the AIM controversy, uh, and that centered around technology, and I suggested to the panel, even if they did not select me for the ethics review panel, that they should find some people to appoint who knew something about information technology. Well, shortly after that, uh, and they gave me a very, very quick rejection, and it was very evident to me that uh, within 10 seconds of going into that room that, that they had already picked their person and were not considering me. But I said, if you don't pick me, please try to pick some people who have a little bit of background in IT. Um, but did they? I, I don't know. I did a little bit of research, and I think they appointed a union guy with no apparent background in IT. Now, it turns out, at that time, we had only one member of this board who, as far as I know, had much IT background, Ms. Causey. Now we have three, Mr. Young, uh, Ms. Hen. So we have a critical mass now. But uh, my request to you is to, is to tell me why were the bios taken off? Could someone please put them back? And uh, maybe uh, we should try to work a little bit harder to have people who have the proper credentials to evaluate the ethics of the board and the administration. So please put some bios back and let us know who the people are. All these question marks are really not appropriate and it's just another example of the, the one more example of the lack of transparency of the board and the administration of the Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ricardo Ramsey. A good evening, board. Uh, good evening. Chairman Gilma, Gillis, Ms. White, rest of the board. Uh, my name is Ricardo Ramsey. I introduced you to myself to you a few months ago as that mad Woodlawn parent. That's make a difference parent. I uh, asked to come just to come to thank you guys for all the effort and all the help that's going into Woodlawn High School. There's a lot of excitement going on at the school there. There's a lot of uh, great things that are happening within the Woodlawn High School, excuse me, and also the Woodlawn community. I'd like to also congratulate Ms. White as being one of the first 10 nominees for the Baltimore County Interfaith Alliance, which is having a honorary luncheon on January 15th for Martin Luther King's birthday. Uh, there are a lot of things going on in the Woodlawn High School, and I feel that so goes Woodlawn, goes the community. Uh, Ms. White has the full support of the Woodlawn High School staff, students, and parents. They have, she has the full uh, support of Morningstar Baptist Church, which I'm a member, which has recently moved to Woodlawn uh, this past Saturday. Uh, the Security Woodlawn Business Association has their support behind Ms. White. And there's a lot of great things that's coming to Woodlawn, the community as a whole. And I feel that I can speak for everyone that I'm associated with that Ms. White is the perfect candidate to become superintendent. I thank you guys and have a happy holiday. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I want to say ahead of time, I hope everybody's looking forward to the holidays. I sure am. Um, there's a, a lot of exciting things happening. Um, today, you guys are going to vote on the boundary study as proposed in front of you for Baltimore Highlands and Lansdowne High School. And our principals are here. They're back there. They're pretty awesome. And um, it's, it's heartbreaking at the same time, even though it's really exciting. Um, because one of the proposed state streets that will be zoned into the new elementary school is actually my street that has a lot of advocates and a lot of families that live on that street that have advocated for the Baltimore Highlands community. Um, so I hear a lot of communities talking about all the great stuff they're doing. And um, 
we need to communicate more and make more efforts to communicate with our communities. We work a little different in the Baltimore Highlands Riverview Lansdowne. Um, we had a very low participation at the boundary study for the final testimony, and I'm asking for a request to please put a connected message out to the families and all the feeding schools um, in the area so they could get a chance to participate tomorrow for the proposal for the renovation for the high school, because that's another big topic issue that's um, dear to my heart. Um, I got involved in the Baltimore County aspects of the funding. Um, they made a decision last night. It was $43 million out of a surplus that I kept reaching out to our councilman asking if that pay to go funds could be used for our high school. And I was told no three weeks ago. But I watched it handed over to another community. And I want to see nothing but the best, nothing less for my pocket and my community, because we want to be better, we want to improve, we want to help our children. I have a minute left and I want to talk about another little topic that's dear to my heart. I want to thank Ms. White for coming out for the GT um, Advisory Council. We have a very large school district, and five members to help our GT students. My youngest child is a GT student, and he should be challenged academically, not just academically, because he's a bright kid. He could do a lot of academic works independently, but I want to see his social skills to work together as a team and communicate to be a leader in the future. I don't want that area being neglected either. So communication is very important for our school district, and I'm counting on this board and Ms. White to move Baltimore County forward to create balance, because that's what we need. We need balance, transparency, and we need to work together as a whole in improving our communication. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Hembling. I need glasses now. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent White, members of the board, I'm Liz Hembling and a chapter leader for Decoding Dyslexia Maryland. Members of our organization from Baltimore County, as well as those around the state, tuned in to listen to the presentation made to the curriculum committee last week about dyslexia. We are all thrilled that Ms. Shea, Ms. Ryder, along with Dr. Wheeler, took the time to share all they are doing to impact reading in Baltimore County. Because Ms. White has chosen to focus on literacy, I highly encourage all of you to listen to their presentation. This is one of the most aggressive plans to retrain teachers that we have seen from a public school system in Maryland. As an organization, we regularly hear from families. We have heard from parents that their elementary schoolers were proactively screened, identified, and have begun Orton-Gillingham instruction. They are witnessing progress never experienced by the family before. Here is a quote from one mom I spoke with recently. Quote, my child has had IEP support for three years, and in that time I saw little to no progress. Now with Orton Gillingham, I see progress each week with her reading skills, something I never thought would happen. I am ecstatic, end of quote. Well, we, well, it makes me, I mean, it, it just makes you very um, touched to hear these stories. And there are a lot more where that came from. While we're seeing massive progress where structured literacy is being targeted, mainly K through two, we do see gaps where this isn't being implemented. While iReady is being used as a tool to help kids be productive in early grades during small group instruction, <coughs> parents of older dyslexic students are still reporting that their children are being put in iReady as their only form of reading intervention, which is not appropriate. We know change isn't easy, and as I said to Ms. Ryder, it's hard to turn an aircraft carrier. We are happy that Baltimore County is taking on the challenge. As we look forward to the new year, here are some ways that the board can help support literacy in 2018. One, listen to the curriculum meeting presentation on dyslexia from December 14th. Two, keep asking questions. When you go and visit schools, ask how they are identifying struggling readers and what they're doing about it. Three, know your literacy numbers. Baltimore County has detailed information for every grade regarding percentage of students on grade level. Ask for it. Third grade numbers just aren't enough. You need data for all grades in Baltimore County. 
Finally, you are all in education circles with our leaders statewide. Ms. Shea spoke about teachers coming out of our local teacher colleges, including, including Towson State, not prepared with the background or experience to teach reading. Even those with a master's in reading are not given this train, training in higher ed, and as a result, Baltimore County is having to fund what higher ed should be doing. You need to understand this and advocate for these changes as you advocate for education across the state. Thank you, and see you in 2018. Our next speaker is Charlene Benke. Good evening, Good Chairman evening. Gillis, Superintendent White, and board members. I am Charlene Benke, principal of the new Northeast Area Elementary School. Having worked in our school system since 1991, I have to tell you that there have been many programs and initiatives that teachers and schools have seen come and go over the past 25 years. Some have been very good, some just okay, and some were downright not good at all. Tonight I brought a list that I had quickly made, um, but I'm not going to go through and rate all of the programs from the last 25 years for you. But you can trust me to tell you that the past 25 years have brought about significant change in how we do business, including major changes in instruction, school safety, and communication. Our current superintendent, Verlita White, has been present for this evolution. She has what I would call institutional knowledge that brings with it an understanding of our organization and our work. That is a primary reason she is so supported by many of us out in school buildings. The level of respect and admiration that many in our system have for Ms. White is not given. It is hard earned. She has been a teacher, a mentor, and assistant principal and a principal prior to entering central office. I see her role the last few years like that of an assistant principal. As she has assisted the previous superintendent with implementing his vision for our school system. Just as a new school principal takes on the helm of a school, she has now moved into the seat of school system leader. In the past few months, she has outlined her vision, including a focus on literacy instruction in all classrooms and a focus on improving school climates and student behavior. We are on board. We want to go forward in the direction that she has set because we trust her. In fact, it is those of us that have known her throughout her career in BCPS that can best share with you that she has never had hidden agendas or interest in doing any work other than improving teaching and learning. It has always been that way. No self-promotion necessary. When BCPS succeeds, she succeeds, and in fact, her own children and our school system benefit. I want to thank Ms. White this evening for her dedication to our system over so many years and for taking on this role with the same passion for work that I've known her to have. Like all teachers, I am only interested in helping our system provide the best education for our students. And I wanted you to know the perspective that many of us in the schoolhouses have. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah. And also I really want to wish all Baltimore County residents happy holidays, whichever holidays they believe in or celebrate. One of the stories that I really enjoyed being American is Santa. And what I like about Santa and what relates to education is that Santa loves all kids. You know, the holidays are not really about spending money in Macy's and others. It's really about loving people. And Santa loves all kids, no matter whom they are. He works hard. All engines are on, no pollution, and 
he spreads really love everywhere. So, you know, where I grew up, and it was the same back home, and the same now, and it should be, you know, being here, my, my own home. Santa doesn't know politics, all right? And I really think this is really an important attribute for all of us. Does not lie, tells the truth all the time. And that's really very important for all of us training um, children to be our future leaders and workers. So, you know, knowing the gifts that Santa gives, he has gifts for all. And he has enough gifts. And watching the Board of Education about air conditioners and reparations and rehabs and building new schools, I really think you need to put that in your heart and your mind in the next time that you would ask for all what the school system needs. You know that the county is giving perks to a contractor in Towson to build a very nice building. And I understand the rationale for doing that. But you know, sitting in the board for so many years and we know the condition of our schools and inadequacy of the support group, et cetera, you know, why there is money for building another high rise in Towson and there is no enough money to hire more teachers, more supportive staff, repair and have air conditioners and all. So um, it's a holiday time. And to me, that's how I relate this to, to the Board of Education. And I really hope that uh, all of us will have a happy holidays, whichever they are. And we learn from Santa the good things and apply it in our school system. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cheryl Thim. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, and board members. I am Cheryl Thim, principal of Bear Creek Elementary School, and I thank you for your service and for my opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'm here to share my support for our interim superintendent, Mrs. White. I began my career with Baltimore County under the leadership of Dr. Marcioni. In terms of Baltimore County years, my relationship with Mrs. White seems short. Although we shared the same decades of teaching and leadership as assistant principals and in the principalship. I met Mrs. White in 2006 as the new principal of Bear Creek. She was principal of Seneca Elementary at that time and soon to be coordinator of leadership development. It was in this capacity that I had the fortunate opportunity to learn and to grow with her, Verlita, as colleagues and leaders. As a new principal, I participated in the professional development coordinated by Mrs. White. We had a robust, sustained, rigorous, and collegial PD program for new principals and assistant principals. I was inspired by Mrs. White's leadership style, presence, and passion for teaching and learning. She was always focused on our learning as leaders, genuine and kind. We not only shared best practices, but we shared family stories of our very own young children. We forged a bond as colleagues under her leadership, as part of leadership meetings, focus groups, professional development, and today, many of us with 30 plus years of experience still call upon one another as friends and colleagues for guidance and support. Fast forward to this school year. As interim superintendent, Mrs. White established a clear vision for our system and a focus for leadership development. We've been engaged in ongoing dialogue and learning about literacy in our communities and with our colleagues. We have stayed the course in our year of this work, developing our leadership capacity to create and support conditions for literacy. Under Ms. White's leadership, we have been given the roadmap for professional learning, the resources to build our capacity, and the time and opportunity to dialogue and learn with our colleagues before rolling out new work. It has a familiar feel of sustained, focused, important collegial work. One final comment, several weeks ago during American Education Week, Mrs. White visited Bear Creek unannounced and without fanfare. She joined me in visiting classrooms, bustling with parents and students engaged in learning. She introduced herself to each teacher she encountered and to each parent. She sat down on the floor and engaged in learning with a group of children and parents. She asked me about our year, our goals, and our challenges. 
She asked about my family. She asked what we needed from her to support our work. Distinguished board members, this is what we need to support our work and our communities. We need Mrs. White's experience, tenure, and unassuming, genuine, and focused leadership. She is us. We'd like to wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful warm holiday. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I thank all of the public speakers this evening. Uh, next on our agenda is item G, uh, proposed boundary for Lansdale Elementary School, and I invite Dr. Brown and Dr. Martin Knox to come forward. Sure. Yeah. Good evening, Chair Gillis, uh, Vice Chair Mr. Stewart, and congratulations to you both on your nom uh, nomination to this. Um, this evening, uh, we're here to present to the board and the community the recommendation again uh, for the lands down uh, boundary, and Dr. Martin Knox will, will review that briefly for you. Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. This evening, I bring forward for your approval the committee recommendation for the Lansdowne Elementary School boundary change. The following factors were the driving force or the need to examine the boundaries in the Lansdowne area. First, the reconstruction and the expansion of Lansdowne Elementary School slated to open for the 2018-2019 school year with an increased capacity from 313 to 709. In order to make the best and most efficient use of this added student capacity, in accordance with the Board of Education Policy and Rule 1280, the superintendent approved the initiation of the boundary study process. Through the boundary study, Baltimore County Public Schools supports a process that is fully engaging with our community and shares information about the process as it unfolds openly with all stakeholders. The Boundary Study Committee for Lansdowne Elementary School met four times between 2017 of September through to November 2017 to formulate and review various boundary change options. The committee also spent countless hours between meetings reviewing information while also meeting the objectives of the boundary study process. The committee, during its meeting times, reviewed and agreed upon neighborhood planning blocks to support the study, created and discussed and reviewed multiple options that were presented, utilized multiple means of communication, such as the use of our BCPS website, email, and interactive maps to review options and to collaborate between meetings. The committee considered all input and information developed throughout the boundary study process. All voting members that were present unanimously recommended option A. This evening is the final step in the boundary recommendation or in the boundary study process as we come before you this evening seeking your approval for the committee's recommendation of option A. All right, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation option A for Lansdowne Elementary School boundary? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All right, it looks like we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin Knox. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Brown. Next on our agenda, item H, is personnel matters, and we invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and leaves. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits H1, H2, and H3? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, though that motion carries as well. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Next on our agenda is item I, and that is consideration of action taken in closed section, and we invite uh, Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered one appeal regarding a confidential student matter uh, in your quasi-judicial capacity. This was an oral argument where the board heard from the parties involved in the appeal. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session. 
which was oral argument. Hearing examiner number 18-22. Uh, Is there a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, not participating in the vote because obviously I was not participating in the, in the discussion. Very good. Very good. All right, all in favor of the motion, please uh, raise your hands. All right, and... Um, please note uh, that I'm abstaining. And, okay, very good. And opposed? Very good. Thank you. The order's on the table for signature. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda is item J. Um, it's the uh, report on policies, and I invite Mr. Virch, Mr. Virch to take the floor. Mr. Chair, <coughs> members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks our board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed amendments to the following board policies. One, policy 0300, equal employment opportunity. Two, policy 3123, financial reporting. Three, Policy 6401, Advanced Academics. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit J. All right, do I have a motion to adopt the uh, recommendation of the board's policy review committee? Moved. All right, no second is required. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you. Continue, Mr. Virch. Mr. Chair and members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee recommends that the board direct the superintendent and staff to explore options of extending the high school day starting in 2018 through 2019. The committee asks that the board accept this report of the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee. Is there a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. No need for a second. Any discussion? All, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate um, our uh, chair of the PRC bringing the recommendation forward, and I appreciate uh, the chair of the board uh, giving it an opportunity to be an agenda item. Um, I have had the opportunity to speak with um, key educators, including our interim superintendent, Ms. White, and um, our um, Ms. Abby Baton from TABCO, and um, I would suggest that we amend the recommendation to, um, to state that it is for um, all of the school days and that it is uh, not, um, that it's not set to be 2018, 2019, but rather to determine what is the earliest time frame. Because I understand from Ms. White that uh, indicating the 2018, 2019 time frame may not be realistic, may be a real, um, and even if it were able to be done, would not really allow for uh, proper input from all stakeholders and community members. And it would also, um, if, if it's going to be a problem, it will give the administration additional time to do a very smooth implementation if, in fact, a decision is made to extend the school day. Very good. For clarification, I'll um, ask if I'm correct in you stating that um, uh, even though only high school days need more time, this would obviously influence all teachers and there would have to be a review of the contract with the union for all teachers. Yes, and that's based on information that I received from um, Ms. Baton from TABCO. Is there a second to amend the motion? Second. Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor of the, um, the motion to amend, please raise your hand. All right, now on the amended motion, all in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand. Very good, thanks. Both pass and uh, we thank uh, Mr. Virch and the Policy Review Committee for their work. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item K and that is uh, uh, the work session regarding the 2019 proposed County capital budget. I invite Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit and Mr. Smith to come forward. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, 
Madam Superintendent, members of the board. I'm joined by Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit, who will join me in presenting the FY19 county capital request as presented. Um, it's the capital request is a process that we go through throughout the entire um, capital planning process from the state portion to the local portion. This has gone through a tremendous amount of discussion that has taken place uh, related to community input, stakeholder input, um, meeting with our schools, our school communities to make sure that um, the, um, the wishes and the desires of the schools were a part of our discussion during this process. I'm joined now by Mr. Saris and Mr. and Mr. Dixon, who will go through the various items. Um, and if you have any questions at that time, you can certainly pr provide those questions to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening to all of you. Um, board had approved a state capital program in the meeting of September 12th. This capital program is count county share of the same capital program. All of the projects that were approved by the board in the state program are included in this exhibit. The exhibit also shows this, the county funding that is being requested. To make the presentation short and quick, if you look at the last three columns, these are the new columns that you had not seen before. The second from the extreme right column is the program county funding for 2020. So this is the additional amount that is being requested from county as part of to support the county share of the capital program. The third column from the right shows the county funding in prior appropriations. So those funds have already been appropriated by county and the, uh, the, the, the FY 2020 funds will be part of the future bond referendum. Just want to remind the board that the county funds are made by bond referendum and bond referendum is done for two years. So the next bond referendum will be for FY 2020 and 2021. The funds from the previous bond referendum were for fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19. In addition to the state capital program, we have uh, fuel tanker placement, access for disabled, transportation improvement, major maintenance, uh, code updates, and roof and site improvements. These are 100% county funded projects. That's the only change from the, uh, from the state plan that you had approved. Now if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. Any questions from the board about the proposed county capital budget? I'll remind everyone, and we'll probably say it again, um, uh, this matter is scheduled for a vote by this board um, on January 9, 2018. Questions? Anyone? Mrs. Causey. Thank you. In the Pine Grove Middle School project, um, with an addition of 300 seats, what is the total number of seats that the um, school system is hoping to uh, receive from that? The proposed is 300, but we, we are not sure about the final numbers. They'll be fine-tuned as more information becomes available. But at this time, the proposal is for an addition of 300 seats. Does it include an auditorium? Uh, we have not worked on, we have not done any design so far. It'll be done more information will be available as the design development proceeds. So in terms of um, design development, what community involvement uh, has occurred? Or, or any community involvement around a 300-seat addition to Pine Grove Middle? Community involvement is at the, during the time of the ADSPEC development. We have a member of the community, member of the school faculty, and they are part of the ADSPEC development, which has not taken place so far. And what about uh, involvement of the school's administration and the, teachers? The, school, the principal is part of our team, and so is the community superintendent. Currently? They will be when the ADSPEC is developed. We haven't gotten to that step yet. We haven't gotten to that. get to that, they will be whoever the principal and the community soup is at that time. Okay, so there hasn't been community involvement yet and there has not been school admi administration involvement yet. 
so um, is the, is your philosophy that if you add 300 seats that you'll take it up to a fifth, over a 1500 seat school? But the, um, the, the current enrollment is about is about 11 or 1200. I think it will be somewhere in that neighborhood, but I'm gonna check with Dr. Brown just to make sure I wouldn't wanna tell you something that we can't stand behind. Okay, and while he's looking that up, the reason I ask is um, I did visit the school recently with uh, the addition in mind. <clears throat> And it seems very full in, not just from my opinion, but from um, visiting the school and having um, conversations with folks in the school. Um, it is one of those schools, it was an open space school and then they had to um, build walls um, thus and so to make classrooms. Some of them are still open door, they don't have a door that closes. Um, so in looking throughout the school, it's, not up to state rate capacity, but it seems very full. So I just want to know, before the project gets too far down the road, what is the expectation for how many students will be able to attend that school in order to provide relief from the nearby schools that are over capacity? That's what I want to understand. And if it's something that you need to give to us in the weekly update that- We'd work with the superintendent to get that back to- That would be fine. Um, the other thing, if you could please provide on an update to the board in the weekly update, is um, where we are with the interagency committee on school construction, their recommendations based on our list. Some projects are deferred or approved, um, suggested funding along with it, so that would be helpful for us to understand um, ahead of the vote. So is that something that would be possible? Where the IAC stands? Currently. We'll have that information. At this time, we have 90% funding, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we'll share, we'll, through the superintendent's office, we'll provide you with that information. Right, because I, I did receive um, the recommendation forms that they, that they distribute, but the, it's not legible in the form that I received it. And it would be helpful for the whole board to have all, of, all the same information. Um, the other question I have is, how much is a typical amount to set aside for planning for a high school? There, there is no typical amount. It depends on the size of high school and the number of students, the program, and all of that. So what was the last high school that we built that you had planning money for? What was that roughly? The last high school was Dundalk Sellers Point. It was approximately $102 million project, and the planning was in the neighborhood of eight to ten million dollars. Not design, just planning. The entire planning, including okay. design and construction management. Planning funds include design and construction management. Okay, so that was eight to nine million. That's approximate number? Right, just approximate, that's fine. Um, I won't hold you to it. Yeah. <laughs> and then has any additional consideration been given to down the road um, or even in association with the other things that we're doing with an addition to Ridge, Ridgely Middle School, which has overcrowding currently? Um, currently the capital plan, uh, it, it, it is not on this capital plan, but as we work with our planning folks and draw, um, we certainly look at those schools that would be um, good candidates for um, additions and renovations and things of that nature, so we'll continue to work, but at this point in time it is not on the current uh, forecast for that school to receive additional seats, but that could change based on our enrollment fluctuations as we move through. Because concerns that I've heard from parents is that if um, a large addition is put at Pine Grove Middle and their school's overcrowded, they may have some of their students um, redistricted to Pine Grove Middle, but then they would have to come to Delaney High School. So they would have these um, students coming together briefly and then m moving into different directions, so it's just a little more disruptive than the flow that there is currently there. Thank so that's why I was asking the question. Great question. Certainly all of that will be ad addressed during the boundary process for for the Pine Grove project, and that, that will flesh out with community input as we go through that process. So when would you see would be the time frame for the redistricting process for my Pine Grove Middle? We don't have that at the time. We can, we can get that back for you, but I would hate to okay. speculate because we're, we're still in those planning pieces designing that, so. Yes, that would be good to know. Thank you. All right, any further questions? Mrs. Eaton. 
Are we still in the planning stages for Dundalk Elementary School? No, Dundalk Elementary School, we are in the final planning phases. The contract, I'll give you the exact date for the award of contract. Uh, we'll come to you for the preliminary design in the January 9th meeting. That's when we share with you the design. Mm -hmm. And then construction contract, we are projecting February and school opening September of 2019. Um, when I went to one of their meetings, there was concern that um, Dundalk Elementary School is on a historic site, and there was some debate whether to tear the school down or to rebuild that school or save a wall. Have we decided that yet? Yes, we've met with the community several times. As you'll recall, you were there in one of the meetings. Uh, we follow the protocol from the Maryland Historical Society during design development stage. And the final outcome of that discussion was that the community was heavily in favor of replacement of that school. Okay, good. Which is what we are doing. Okay, thank you. And we are also working with, in the design, we're hoping to bring in the design something that can um, <laughs> still save that, that um, historic feel of that site. We try to do that with all, the, all of our projects. Sometimes it works better in others, and the, but we're, we're definitely trying to do that and we hope that with the presentation will come forward on January 9th, um, some of that will glean through. Mr. Birch. Thank you very much. Um, if it's green, it's mean, right? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. Um, with regard to Pine Grove Middle School, that actually has a state rated capacity. And again, it's just a number with a title, state rated capacity of 1293. And while these enrollments kind of go up and they can kind of go down and et cetera, right about now it's at about uh, 927 or so. Now, there's still the issue with regard to, um, at least that's what's posted anyway, mm -hmm. uh, there's still the issue with regard to the number of, of staff. And that's, that's probably a conversation for another day. But I was just there last week and there was really a really special program that was put on by the PTA and it was unfortunate that more that there weren't other board members who had the time to be able to come because it was really interesting to see parents and staff and the administration uh, interacting on an issue of school climate and what uh, the expectation of our Pine Grove Middle School families are as well as the uh, the folks in the school. It's really a, a really good staff at that school. But what I wanted to ask you about something a little bit different and you had uh, mentioned in, in passing some of those items that are at the bottom of the list. And you indicated that they're at the bottom because there is no state funding that's made available for things like um, access for the disabled. That's at item 38. And there's no state funding available for uh, transportation improvements. There's no funding available from the state for transportation improvements. <coughs> and there's no funding available from the state either for alterations or code updates or or restoration like uh, there was that uh, bit of a flood at our at our Hawthorne Elementary School in our sixth district and that uh, that restoration effort is still underway and we have that art room that we're trying to get restored and we've made claims with regard to insurance but there's no state dollars that are available for for any of those kind of projects isn't that right mm -hmm. and there's no there's no state dollars available for roof rehabilitation none no state dollars, is that right? No, let, let me clarify yeah. that. Mm -hmm. When we build a school, it mm -hmm. has to comply with ADA regulations. Sure. And at that time, state funds are available to support that. For construction, For construction. but to kind of come back, to retrofit, to modify, to change. If we have a specific project like an elevator replacement mm -hmm. and we submit it as state project, mm -hmm then it is, it is eligible for state funding. What you are looking at here is mm -hmm. that if the elevator broke down or if some of the upgrades that are in the building need enhancement, mm -hmm. this is where these funds are needed. All of the, while all the buildings comply with ADA, they are at varying degree of compliance for individuals. So if there's an individual has a special need beyond the minimum requirement that we have complied with, then we use these funds to make that happen. And Mr. Dixit, when you use the term, 
these funds, you're referring to, to the, the funds county, the that are identified as county dollars, is That's that right? It. That's okay. Correct. And I noticed that the last one are site improvements. Mm -hmm. And if you could just briefly share with members of the board, like site improvements uh, is an example of that, like that erosion repair at, McCor at our McCormick Elementary School, is that like a site improvement? That's site improvement. Mm -hmm. If the site improvement was part of a renovation project or part of a new school, it qualifies for state funding. But if but it's standalone, then it, then it does not qualify for state funding. Then, mm -hmm. we, well, qualifies, but there are not there there are not projects ahead of that in terms of priority. Mm -hmm. That county has agreed to provide funds, 100% funds for those site improvements because they're county dollars, and our local government has uh, the ability to direct the expenditure of those funds for those things. That's now, true. I would like to direct your attention to item 38, the access for the disabled. Mm -hmm. And uh, in preparation for tonight's meeting, I had sent in an email, and you all were able to respond. And while there's various definitions, the term, of, the term that at least is used here is disabled. And we're referring to our disabled students and our disabled staff. Is that right? That's correct. And we have approximately 14 to 15,000 disabled students, assuming we use uh, an agreed upon term for, for identification of our students. Is that right? And we have about maybe 300 or so staff that would fit this this agreed upon uh, definition for disabled. Is that right? That 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 we call accommodation. That sure. means accommodation. And it may be a physical uh, disability, or it may be a non-physical disability. Is that right? That's correct. Now I want to direct your attention to the amount of dollars that we have available identified on this chart. Um, could you give some examples for access for the disabled? Um, I mean, it's difficult to say the average cost of an Access for Disabled project is X thousands of dollars. Um, but if we have some 15,000 of our students and we have uh, 300 of our staff to accommodate the needs of these special populations, um, what sort of projects are we doing, at least what sort of projects are contemplated under this specific category? A lot of these are ADA modifications to the building. Some of them are elevator replacement, where the old elevators are not functioning, or addition of an elevator. Those are the kind of projects that we are seeing. Some, perhaps like an Oakley Elementary School, where there is no elevator, for example. I, I don't know a specific mm -hmm. issue there, but that could be. If there was no elevator, that would be something to be contemplated. But an elevator job, that runs about $300,000, is that right? That's approximate number. And when I. When I take a look here at the amount of, of dollars that, that the county government uh, uh, is identifying for access for disabled, um, did I read that right? That's at about uh, three million. Is that about is that about two point nine million dollars? Yes. 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 Okay. And do you have any idea at this point about how many projects uh, that may represent? across our, say, 175 uh, facilities? I don't have the number of projects at that time. That list is still being developed. Mm -hmm. But I can, I, all that I know is uh, this is about the outdated lifts, elevators, and mm -hmm. those kind of projects. That's all I have. I, I hear you. And tonight is not the last time that we'll be discussing these kind of projects for this particular FY uh, budget. Um, capital budget, uh, to the extent that we have our, our next meeting next month, is that something that um, you feel comfortable being able to review and perhaps get back to us with some feel for those projects? I can give you the feel for the project. I may not have complete list in, in a month time. And, and I understand because these things do evolve and something may not be a priority right now, but it could, it could change later. All right. Thank you very much. And in behalf of the, you know, the 15,000 students <laughs> th uh, of this population and our 300 staff, I thank you very much for your attention to this. Any further questions or comments, Mrs. Miller? Thank you. Can you um, describe for us um, items 39 and 40, transportation improvements and major maintenance? What is included in those? Transportation improvements generally are improvements to the transportation workshop and buildings. There are several facilities that we have that need upgrading. And this, the these are the 11 bus depots that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we're systematically trying to um, 
work on Im um, improving the structures there and, and building it out. Uh, we've got different bus configurations, so we're, we're always trying to continue to modernize our sites um, at, at the various bus lots, the 11 bus lots that we have. Okay. And the major maintenance? Major maintenance is a catch-all category for all of the maintenance work that is needed that, that is not funded in this program or that is not funded in capital program and the operating, operating budget. For example, an emergency boiler or if a, if a chiller fell apart or if there are pumps needed of, or there are additions needed above and beyond this, all of that can only be accomplished through these funds. So you have to have a category for emergency Yes. Because I think we've talked about this before, and, and, and it was described as something that yes. would just, you know, be funded outside of the budget request, I thought. That's right. But, but no, they you're are, including it. the major maintenance as much as we can. Our needs always exceed available funding. That's number one. So they, they exceed uh, capital budget funding. They exceed operating budget funding. But this gives us a little bit of... Uh, a room for to catch some of just those. a cushion yes. okay so it's not nothing that's specified yet it's just nothing that is specified. okay rainy day kind of okay <coughs> all right um, remember everyone this is really yeah, a work session discussion time uh, we'll have this before us to vote on our um, January 9 2018 meeting if there's no further questions we'll move on to the next agenda item thank you thank you the next agenda item is item L, and that is a report on dashboard metrics, our work session topic for the evening. And I invite Dr. Brown and Dr. Cuellar to come forward. And Mr. Chair, as Dr. Brown and Dr. Cuellar are coming forward, I just would like to say uh, thank you to the team um, for really bringing together these dashboard metrics. If you'll recall, uh, during our board retreat this summer, this was something that the board requested um, as uh, one of my deliverables, quite frankly. And um, staff has done a, a tremendous job to make sure that we have some um, outward facing data for our board and for our public as well. So in terms of transparency, uh, this is our, um, our first effort toward um, transparency, which certainly uh, not completed or not finished, but this is where we are to date. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown and Dr. Cuellar as well. Good evening again. Good evening. Good evening. No. Can we turn the microphone on? Ah, it's magic. Magic. Okay. Um, oops, too much magic. <laughs> Maybe not enough. Do we need to turn these on? There we go. So, uh, again, uh, good evening, Chair Gillis, uh, Vice Chair Stewart, members of the board and community. I'm here with Dr. Quayer and pleased to have an opportunity to present to you uh, the culmination of work uh, really that has extended over. And I'll just remind the board members, I just turned my screen on, so if you want to follow the PowerPoint, you can turn your screens on. Keep going, please. Absolutely. Um, really a culmination of work over uh, several years. Um, to frame this, I uh, really want you to understand that, that the work of, of the department around this has been organized around a philosophy, and really students are at the center of everything that we do. Uh, the objective here is really to support database decision making for, for our students uh, with the objective of bringing about improved outcomes for our students. Uh, we really work to identify gaps that exist uh, for our students, monitor in uh, as close as possible to real time the, the effectiveness of programming, and ultimately uh, to provide summative evaluative data uh, regarding the effectiveness of programming that has been put in place. That philosophy um, then translates to some principles, again, students first. And, and so what you're gonna see is that our development process began closest to students and has worked outward over time. And we're gonna continue with that. We will continue to work uh, to serve those who are closest to students, those who work with students on a daily basis first. And then as those tools are developed, we will work them outward to other audiences over time. We focus on actionable data, things that we can actually do something about. And at every level, 
uh, as we work through this process, uh, student data privacy is just an absolute must. Uh, we're guided by policy and rule on this, and it is something that we take very seriously, and it informs, and you will see it, it informs every step of this process as we move through. A little bit of context again. Uh, this didn't develop just in the last couple months. It, this really has been a work in progress uh, across the last three years. Uh, we, I was fortunate when I came here that the team had an existing um, historical data warehouse and we had some teacher reports. But three years ago, we did not have any uh, school-based dashboards and we had no central office dashboards and we certainly weren't prepared to have anything for the board and the community. Again, we started closest to our, our students and have worked outward and today uh, we're in a place where we can uh, finally release some data to the community openly and we also have some data uh, for the board specifically. As I transition to Dr. Quayer, um, you're gonna see there's sort of an echoing format to how we, we've gone through this. You're gonna hear us talk about, you know, for whom is th this dashboard that we're talking about currently? Uh, why was it developed? What does it do? And, and how uh, is it uh, managed mechanically as we go forward? And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Quayer, who I think is uh, more than ready to, to talk about how this is uh, enacted in our schools and in our central office. Good evening, everybody. Um, as we know, teachers are our most important resource um, in the education and development of our students, um, hence the important that our teachers have a single access point uh, to timely student level data for the purpose of monitoring and influencing student outcomes. Uh, teachers have access to historical student level data, including content areas such as course schedule, academics, culture and climate, and demographics. All of these equate to teachers making judicious and informed decisions to be responsive to student needs. Um, just to reiterate, of course, um, one of the focuses always has been here at BCPS that uh, we continue to continue to focus on growth and achievement um, throughout for our students. Uh, to reiterate in terms of what this slide is saying is that teachers um, will have secure access to data which is restricted to only the teacher of record. So it's important that um, as teachers do have access to this dashboard, teachers will only be able to have access um, to the students that are specific to their class. Um, only um, the, data, the, the data will show um, the students assigned to the teacher using the course schedule and one of the things also is that we require all internal staff um, to sign an acceptable user agreement. Teachers have access to the data and reporting tab on BCPS1 which breaks down the following key components at the student level uh, which is called the student profile. Uh, teachers have access to specific data and reporting tiles such as demographics, course schedule, attendance, grades, and achievement. And this slide clearly illustrates um, a clear view of what a teacher's access point looks like. While it's critical for teachers to have access to individual students, uh, it's equally important for school leadership teams uh, to have access to view student, students and groups of students across the school to make informed decisions on school progress planning and continuous improvement. Dashboards and reports that displaying historical building data um, also have the ability to drill down to the student level. Schools have secure access uh, to this data which is restricted to only the specified students of record that are enrolled at that specific school. Again, all internal staff are required to sign an acceptable use agreement for the access and use of this specific data. This is an example of a school attendance tab that school leadership teams would have access to. Attendance can be viewed school-wide, by grade level, by race, on a quarterly basis. If you click on the blue field, you'll have access to individual student information, which does include attendance percentage and any groups that they identify to. Schools also have access to the Leading for Equity tab. Uh, within the tab, it provides information for enrollment, program access, suspension, and thrive status by race, limited English proficiency, socioeconomics, and gender. Thrive is a predictor of college and career readiness that combines academic achievement, growth, suspension, attendance, and coursework. Uh, schools utilize Thrive data to monitor uh, and identify targeted groups of students uh, that are potentially at risk of not meeting the college and career readiness standards. Based on the data, schools develop, strategic, uh, develop strategies and action plans that can serve as interventions and proactive measures to support the specific student academically and behaviorally. The stakeholder survey dashboard presents information based on student, parent, and staff feedback on critical measures such as school climate and culture. 
This specific dashboard gives the viewer the capacity to see the feedback data from all stakeholder groups. As it's important for teachers and school leadership teams to have access to timely data, it's, critically, um, it's equally critical for central office to have access to data across the system, which can be specific to area, zone, level, school, and the individual student. Central office access includes members of the curriculum instruction team, as well as community superintendents and executive directors and our staff. Central office personnel have secure access to the data, which is at the system-wide level, and the capability to narrow down by area, zone, school, and student. Again, as reiterated in previous slides, all internal staff are required to sign an acceptable use agreement for the access and use of the specific data. This is an example of an ESOL dashboard tab that provides information about English language learner students, their native countries, and of home languages. It's organized by enrollment, by grade level, showing trends in enrollment, number of students speaking different home languages, years in ESOL services, and current levels of WIDA proficiency. The WIDA assessment looks at the development of English language proficiency skills such as listening, speaking, reading, and writing. The assessment evaluates the student's level of proficiency and provides prescriptive skills and strategies that support differentiated instruction and targeted student intervention. The WIDA, the WIDA assessment um, starts in January and concludes in February and is rated based off of five levels. This specific tab focuses on the graduation and dropout rate um, of a four-year cohort, which can, be which can be broken down by zone, area, subgroup, and school. <coughs> and this tab is on the central office dashboard, which focuses on enrollment by school, grade level, area, zone, and subgroup. You can, you can view enrollment by the September 30th cutoff date, as well as enrollment data that is current of the date that you're, re that you're looking. <coughs> So that um, summarizes the dashboards that have been developed and available to our central office schools and schools to, to um, and teachers, pardon me, uh, to this date and time. We're now transitioning to those that, that have been developed and are being released today. So um, we're going to look at the dashboards that are now available to the board and have not been available previously, as well as the dashboard that we made available to the public today uh, and is actually on the BCPS webpage. So uh, as the interim superintendent pointed out earlier today, uh, the board was uh, very clear in terms of its uh, request to have additional data and, and have access to different uh, additional <coughs> data. So uh, in response to that, we have, uh, again, worked some of these dashboards outward from central office to the board as a whole. And again, the objective here is to provide uh, a single access point uh, to timely data for uh, the purposes of system government, governance. Uh, the dashboards uh, that will be available cover climate, academics, and enrollment uh, for the system. <coughs> and again, uh, these dashboards, like all the dashboards that I've described to this point and, and Dr. Cuellar has gone through, are all behind our firewall. So they require that, that staff or, or representatives of the board, in this case, log into BCPS1 to have access. There is no way uh, that you can get access to any of these except through uh, BCPS1 and through appropriate credentials managed by IT. These um, dashboards will carry aggregate system-wide data, and there, is, um, there are data suppression rules that are applied to that to comply with FERPA guidelines to ensure st uh, student privacy. So one of the dashboards that, that is present for board members, that again, we've elevated this upward, is an enrollment dashboard, which allows you to look, again, at enrollment, um, not only the September 30th enrollment, but also enrollment to date. So you can see the changes in enrollment within a building over time. These will be updated quarterly throughout the, the year. Again, to give you a more updated look on, on our enrollment data as we move forward through the academic year. Um, there are a variety of ways that this data can be manipulated. You can subset buildings, you can disaggregate it by gender, race, et cetera. And I promise we will set up some training times for folks to be able to, to have some access on how to uh, work with these. Um, though I think they're rather intuitive, we will still provide some training opportunities in the near future. A second has to do with suspensions. This one will initially be a report. Um, and again, part of this is it's part of the development process as we're working out and we apply suppression rules to this. We will also have a similar style dashboard for this, but you will have suspension data again updated periodically. The board will also have an attendance dashboard and much like the enrollment dashboard, this is one that will be updated quarterly. 
and that will allow the, the board again to subset buildings, uh, to apply filters, and to manipulate uh, the data to, to subsets of schools or subgroups of students, um, depending on your interest. Uh, there are lots of different questions that can be answered through this dashboard, and it is a way for you to have additional information uh, to be thoughtful about the governance of the organization. And finally, uh, you also have a graduation dashboard, uh, much like the one that was described uh, for curriculum instruction. Uh, this allows us to uh, disaggregate data and look at changes in the graduation rate over time uh, within the system. In addition to those four dashboards that I, I described, you'll, you'll also notice off to the one side there's a tab there for help. There is help information already available in those for you. But again, we will follow up with additional training shortly. Now we're switching and we're going to talk about public dashboards. And uh, again, today we actually released a public dashboard uh, tied to our stakeholder data uh, for the system as a whole. Uh, and again, the audience here is meant to be you know, our, our public in general, our parents, uh, community members, et cetera. And again, over time, what you're going to see is we're going to build this out. We're starting with the stakeholder data. But with, as with all the other dashboards, the purpose here is to have a single point of uh, entry for parents or, or interested parties to be able to get information about the system. Uh, these dashboards will provide um, system-wide data. This one, will, again, initially will be stakeholder survey data. And they're available to anyone in the public. So these are very different than everything that have been discussed so far. Everything that I've discussed so far in terms of dashboards are behind a firewall. This is publicly available. That was done quite intentionally. Uh, we wanted to absolutely break the relationship between publicly available data and private data that is held within our system. Things that are behind the firewall and things that are publicly available. There is no way to connect between this external data and the individual students who are behind it. It's quite deliberately done to protect student privacy and, and at the same time provide as much transparency and data to the public as possible. Um, with this, obviously, we do pr apply suppression rules, et cetera, to, again, protect, uh, protect the um, privacy of individual students. And again, it's aggregate data um, that we work with in this. Public survey data um, that's out there right now, again, the, uh, this is a screenshot of it. Um, here's another. And I think it might even be better just to look at it in real time. Uh, so we're going to take a moment and have things switched over so I can just walk you through part of that web page in real time. So this is the stakeholder survey dashboard as it exists on BCPS uh, web page currently. Let's see if we can, okay. If you look at this, you will see um, we have information starting with the number of student respondents parent respondents, um, participation over time, disaggregated by elementary, middle, and high school level, both by st uh, students and parents. We have the opportunity down below to uh, disaggregate the data by the, the language of the students who responded, by their gender or their race. And if we pick that, it will update, and we'll see. There we go. Uh, disaggregated data by race. So again, by applying filters, one can, can manipulate the data in this. Uh, the resolution, the way this is set up, it, it makes it a little hard to see, but there's also a map of the county on the right, and if you hover over the dots, it gives individual information by individual schools. And again, filters can be applied to that as well. At the top of this, and I'm having a little trouble with this, this mouse and environment, you'll see that there are a number of tabs across the top. The tabs will pull up uh, individual results for students, parents. Uh, by individual results, I mean uh, results to individual items. Um, and you can see the response patterns for them. And you can change them by domain. So I can look at a domain called belonging, which happens to, to be a very important concept. It's one that the state is uh, spending some time looking at right now for a stakeholder survey for the state as a whole. And it's that idea of 
how do students get along with one another? How do they feel about the relationships with their peers? And we can see the answers to the individual items uh, and the, the degree to which students agree with those individual items. There is a lot of information in this uh, dashboard and a lot of room for, for uh, members of our community to be able to interact with this information <coughs> to ask and answer specific questions that they may, ha may have of interest tied to, to the data. If we could switch back to the PowerPoint now, I'd really appreciate it. And again, that's live today and available to members of our community right now if they so choose to use it. Thank you. So for our board members, when, when you sign in, you're going to see a, an entry point that looks like this. And in it, there will be a data uh, reporting um, icon uh, that I've highlighted here. If you click on that data reporting icon, it's going to take you to BCPS Inform, and you're going to see that you have two uh, tabs or, or icons there for, for that you could uh, click on, one for dashboards and one for reports. If you click on dashboards, it's going to take you into the Board, Board of Education dashboards, but it's also going to give you links to the public dashboard, uh, in this case the stakeholder survey, but again, we'll be building that out. It also takes you to the Maryland State uh, Report Card. The objective here was, again, to give you a single point of access where you can go to, to see multiple points of information. So again, the public dashboards are what I just showed. It takes you out to our, our web page, and you can click on the, the link that will get you to the, the dashboard information I just showed you a moment ago. The other icon, Reports, if you click on Reports, it will take you to an um, environment where you'll have some reports that are organized around assessment, climate, um, our planning information tied to the EFMP and students count, and additional documents uh, tied to data for the system as a whole. So those are the things that are available today. Those are the things that were released today. They're our new release. We're sort of, they're all, we're proud. They're sort of brand new and shiny today. Um, but that's not where we're ending. We're going to keep continue to build. And we're on track, uh, and we expect that by the start of the next school year, to have our blueprint report um, fully available in a public interactive dashboard format, uh, much like the stakeholder data that you see currently. Um, I also expect to have students count and, and the enrollment information, and again, in a public format, public data uh, that folks can interact with. Um, a number of our community members uh, seem to use students count on a fairly regular basis. This, I think, will make it a little bit easier for them to subset down to the things that they're very interested in instead of having to wade through what can sometimes be a fairly cumbersome book. Uh, finally, um, we'll also have assessment data, including park and map uh, data available for the public as well. And uh, again, students are first. And, and we will continue to do iterations of what's necessary to best support our schools, um, you know, our teachers, our principals, and our schools in their uh, support of ed uh, improving educational outcomes for students. Uh, we have a lot of work to do as we gear up uh, in preparation for SI. Thank you. Very good. So I'll start and say we are thankful for the presentation and, uh, uh, and impressed with the, um, the substance and look forward to uh, being able to uh, touch it and use it. Um, are there questions? Yes. Mr. Stewart. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, I know Chuck McDaniels and I uh, are happy uh, that you were uh, allowing of us to bug you as much as we did about these issues. And uh, I know that our superintendent has been a strong supporter, so we appreciate that, uh, to be sure. A couple questions and comments. Uh, you noted that student records are going to be limited generally to only teachers of record. Uh, how does that account for teachers or others who interact with these kids but are not teachers of record, like a reading specialist? And how do we really maximize them, this technology? How do we maximize their ability to coordinate without adding to their schedule and time? Yeah, you know, that, that is a, a challenge that we're currently working on. Um, we have erred initially on the side of student privacy. Uh, but we do have a group of folks who are working to resolve those issues because there are a number of people who are in roles uh, where simply the student rec or the teacher record doesn't quite cut it um, or, or being limited to a school may not necessarily meet the needs of, of the staff person. Uh, but again, initially we've erred on the, on, on 
so we're having a discussion Absolutely. about how we might account for those Absolutely. folks. Okay. Um, from the school to school level, that the same is also true with respect to the limitation on access. So are we considering how in the future to enable, say, a high school to start coordinating with a middle school about accepting their eighth graders and what they might need going forward and really, again, leveraging this technology? Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some of that currently for those eighth graders as they transition. So as eighth graders transition to ninth grade, uh, that data becomes available to them for the incoming ninth grade uh, to high schools. Um, they, I think, again, the point is, though, we have erred on the side of, of being a little conservative with this. Uh, there are certainly a number of cases that can be made uh, for folks who work across buildings uh, who may need to have access. And, again, there's a, a committee that's working on trying to resolve the best way to do that while still ensuring the, the I would data. also just jump in just to say that, you know, the data side is, is really the one side of it. And as Dr. Brown said, the student privacy issue, that's where we've really tried to err on the side of student privacy. But then there's a human aspect to this as well. So whenever we're talking about across grade level, across curriculum content, or across levels, we still, the, the data, you know, are what they are by themselves, but it still requires that human touch in terms of articulation between levels. And we still, we don't want our teachers to become so reliant on the data that then they lose that human aspect. So as we build it out and we consider the privacy issues, we will still um, be strong uh, proponents for that human interaction. Well, that's, uh, uh, I appreciate that comment. That's a nice segue into my next question, which is, Information is, of course, only as good as it's used and it's leveraged. So what, how are we contemplating actually making use of this data? Are there meetings that are being held at the central office level? How do we decide where we're going to deploy resources? Are there effective follow-ups and accountability mechanisms, not just quarterly, but more real time? So I'll, I'll start, and I think Dr. Cuellar will, will, will finish for me. Um, it's actually. That is the connection between our, our offices. So uh, we provide data, and we also provide the structure for the uh, school progress planning process, which uses that data as the anchor point for how schools plan to meet the academic needs of their children, how schools plan to, meet, uh, to improve the climate of their building. The implementation of those plans and what that means for staffing um, and how we allocate resources in support of that is the work of the community superintendents. And um, we utilize this data on a consistent basis, Mr. Stewart. Um, um, it, it helps us be able to formulate our support plan and how we're going to provide very specific focuses and, and supports to specific schools. Um, but in turn, um, to expound on Dr. Brown's statement, um, it then helps propel principals and leadership teams and teachers also um, to be able to keep monitoring and to stay focused on their school progress planning as well. Um, so. Uh, this data, speaking just from the CS side, I mean, this data is looked at daily. Um, it's reviewed daily. It's reviewed weekly. Um, it leads the work that we do in terms of us making um, very focused decisions on how we are going to allocate resources, um, as well as how we're going to support schools in an in, in individualized manner. So. so fair enough, but I guess I heard, or my understanding was that a lot of this data is going to be updated on a quarterly basis, at least as it relates to this technology, but you're saying that it's used on a more real-time basis for you all. Right. So uh, how can we continue to maybe provide that kind of regularly updated data to those others who are going to be using the system. Is that true with our schools? Is that true? Do they have regular access to real-time data? They absolutely do. Okay. Yes, sir. So the limitations really with respect to quarterly is the public and the board. Okay. Is that, uh, I mean, I think we as a board need to have a discussion whether that's sufficient for us or not and whether we believe, you know, that's, that's the proper balance to be had. Um, I think finally, for me at least, well, two more questions. So why is it that, you know, Joe Public can't have access to finances for our schools or for enrollment? I notice it's just academics and climate. So again, if, if you look at the, 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 um, the timeline for releasing additional data to the community, um, I plan on having enrollment as well as our student account information, which would include projections, available on a dashboard to the public. Uh, by fall of this year. So when you say finances, what do you mean then? I didn't say finance on that. There was no finances? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
there are some transitions that are going on uh, around finance uh, and the infrastructure of finance that really need to be resolved before I'm going to invest resources to develop a dashboard. Uh, the underlying data structure may change, and uh, it's like double work, and it's just I not see. a not Well, we, see, we see a slide here with respect to central office that says finance fil filters into this program. Currently, we have some limited data that is available to schools and central office uh, that gets at finance information. I, again, I'm reluctant to build it out because the infrastructure may change, and all that data modeling that's behind it is likely to need to change as well. Um, I think it'd be wiser to wait until we have a stable data structure to build from. Okay. Final, final topic is, I understand why we focus on these areas that we did, but what about those services that are supporting education, like transportation data, you know, how much are we spending on repairs of buses each quarter, security data, the rate of violent incidences, electricity usage. I mean, these are all items that support our school infrastructure, and these are measurable, arguably more so than some of the other subjective or quantifiable data that we have out there. So uh, I'm going to go back to, to where I started, and that is we started with those things that are closest to students or and impact the daily decisions for students. I'm not opposed uh, to thinking about those things over time. They just don't take as high a priority for me as trying to provide information uh, to teachers and to our principals and our department chairs who have to plan for and make daily educational decisions for our students. That's our number one priority. I understand this is young, but I would just encourage us as a system to also look in that direction eventually. Uh, we, we certainly have. Um, it, and you know the Council of Great City Schools has a lovely sort of met set of metrics they've developed over time, and we have spent some time looking at those. Uh, and it's it's part of the roadmap. It it just doesn't have quite as the urgency for me uh, that the data around um, again student achievement, uh, for example, has had. Okay, Ms. Schaefer, you had your hand raised. Um, will the dashboard be available for students and t uh, parents when they log into BCPS One? Like um, when you log in, it says learning management system, digital content. Will the database also be there? So the dashboard that, that is available to the public for the stakeholders is actually available for the web, through the web. Mm -hmm. um, we could potentially put a link where you're describing as well uh, to give multiple points of access to it. Really, when we talk about individual student data, though, um, and for parents who are making decisions on a daily basis about, uh, about their student, the LMS is really the best. The learning management system is really where I'm going to find out about, you know, where you are with your homework, where you are with <laughs> you know, your, your recent test grades, attendance, et cetera. That's where I, as a parent, am going to be able to find that information. Um, dashboards, when you think about them, are really for aggregate information. What's happening for a group of students? What's happening at Pikesville High School, for example, as a whole? Um, and again, those, those are, are aggregate and in the dashboard system. And really, for the most part, wouldn't be appropriate for parents the way they're laid out currently because we haven't had those FERPA rules applied to them. As we scale things out on that roadmap that I'm describing, again, folks are going to be able to see, well, what's happening with the enrollment at, at Pikesville High? Is it trending upward over time? What are we expecting that, that enrollment to be three years from now, four years from now, five years from now? Um, so folks can be engaged with that capital planning process and thinking about what that means and also understand sometimes how we're aggregating buildings for the purposes of, of a boundary process as well. Mr. McDaniels and then Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Stewart said, I am very excited about uh, introducing data and the um, dashboards into uh, our resources that we have to monitor what's going on in the system. I guess um, in particular, you know, I am interest, very interested in the academic and student achievement uh, data that may be out there. And, and you mentioned that we're in the developmental stage and map data and park data will be uh, introduced. Um, and while that tends to be my focus, there may be other board members that some of the transportation data are, are particularly interest. What um, mechanism do you foresee for us as a board to be able to convey to you you know, what kind of things that we want to see. Uh, and again, just, just talking here tonight, I mean, I mean what, how will we go about uh, um, well, I, getting I to that point? I would suggest that in the retreat, you did a lovely job of expressing your interest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and you can see the, the fruits of that. Um, I think that the, 
you know, from my seat, the vehicle for that would be to work through the superintendent, uh, the board chair and the superintendent, okay. uh, to come some, to some consensus around those uh, development priorities, and then we could, could talk about the timelines for those over time. Okay. Um, I do also, just as a caveat around the data that was provided, um, when we look at the, the dashboards that are initially provided to the board, we were actually pretty intentional about trying to put data in front of you that you don't already have. So you don't have enrollment updates during the course of the year currently in, in a report for, format. Now you do. Um, we, I could have started with park data, I could have started with map data, which you already have. You already have reports for that. Instead, we, we tried to provide you data that you don't currently have, and we've supplied the reports concurrently. So you have a fairly complete picture. We will, over time, again, work to create those uh, dashboards to support public access to that data. And an, again, for me, one of the interests here was trying to provide it in a way that uh, our parents and community and the board could interact with it to ask and answer questions that are of interest to them instead of just having a thick report and having to like peel through mm. it to, to get to what they're, they're interested in. I have not seen, um, and I've looked around the state of Maryland and around the country as a whole, many communities, many school systems that have quarterly access to updates of information. This, it's, you, you're really on the weeding edge with that. And even some of the systems that have really nice dashboarding uh, for their community, Oftentimes they're not that interactive. There's, there's really not that much that, that a person can do to, to ask and answer their own questions. So we've really tried to weave agency into that process so that our community and members of the board can subset that data in a way and make it uh, more useful for them. Um, and that development looks a little different than a static page with visualizations. Um, there are some people who do really lovely static pages with visualizations, but they're not interactive and you can't subset and ask questions of your own interest. Thank you. Mrs. Miller, and then we'll just keep working around the room here. Thank you for this. And as somebody who is very interested in safety and technology, I want to thank you for focusing in on the student privacy and protection uh, aspect. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered, uh, so I wanted to ask, and I know this is a work in progress very much, but. Um, uh, whether as far, as far as the board and public data, whether we will be able to disaggregate that by school and get actual school level data. So the ba dashboards that exist for the, the board currently will enable you to uh, subset down to individual schools or subsets of schools. So you can pick an, an individual school or a group of schools if you so desire. Mm -hmm. And again, when I talk about that interactive capacity, that, that's the intent. Okay, I can't tell from this. I but understood. Also, again, we promise there's training coming. <laughs> also, uh, will there be historical data, or, or what are you thinking as far as how far this might go backwards? So, um, in the case of the stakeholder data, there's three years there. Um, as we're looking at uh, achievement data, I suspect that we'll probably be looking at a two to three year window for that, at least initially for the, the start of that. Some of the other data, I, I don't know if we're going to want to, it takes quite a lift to take data from our internal system, completely make it an anonymous and ensure mm. data privacy. Um, I think we may move, I'm just talking here and being honest, we may just move from where we are currently forward because the lift to go backward um, would take a lot of staff time to do and it's not actionable. It's history at that point. Again, we focus on what, what can we actually do something about. I would like to just suggest, though, that that would be really important with all of the many changes that we've had over the past few years to really be able to actually look prior to that would be very valuable to us. So I know that might take a long time to achieve, but that might be an important thing to try to do at some point. Um, Let's see. Um, so I, I know you said that you, you want to focus on growth and achievement and the park and map data will be coming. Um, and I'll just throw it out here, you know, grading and reporting data, discipline data, all of that, is, is that all intended to be included? So again, you have suspension data already on that. Uh, in terms of grading and reporting, um, 
it is not currently part of part of the dashboard. So. That's not in not being planned. No. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that really for our, our parents and, and community members who are accessing information about individual students, that's really an LMS function. It's an LMS function yeah. uh, specific to the parents, students, and the uh, teacher of record. Okay. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to working with you all and, and giving board input into what we would like to see. So thank you very much. Ms. Young, do you have questions? Just a, clar just a clarification. Use... Um, on Ms. Miller's question, she asked you about the, the school data for both, both the board and the community. So I think your answer was the board will have it, so will the community also be able to look at individual schools? So as we're building out dashboards for the community, the, the intent will be for the community to have access to individual Okay, thank you. Mr. Virch. Thanks, Ed. There you got it. Thanks, Ed. Um, gentlemen, thank you for, for your uh, presentation, all the 37 slides. Really. Um, <laughs> We're working. Could have made it longer. Uh, and there's some things I could say, too. Um, nonetheless, what I wanted to ask you about is, uh, are a couple of things. You know, I had the opportunity to go to McCormick Elementary School, uh, I want to say last month or the month before, and um, uh, I began thinking about this concept because Principal Cortesis took me into their data room. She kind of come into the school over on the left-hand side is a data room. And it's really set up to be a functioning sort of tactical center to identify um, concerns and at the ground level, put together a response and then run with it. Um, coming in as a board member, kind of looking at what's going on there, and I, I you know, we use the term governance as the role, what are the, what's the role of the board, um, and I noted that tonight, in one of the policies, and it relates to the gifted and talented, the uh, advanced academics proposed policy 6401, um, there actually is in this draft the term disaggregated data. It's very important to the advisory council to be able to see, to access disaggregated data. And that disaggregated data would be something that would be available publicly whether there were dashboards or there weren't dashboards because that's what's going to be in the policy. Uh, what I wanted to find out though is we have a number of advisory councils and when I hear folks use the term community, um, one of one of the members of our community, of course, are our our, our advisory councils, and I'm I'm I mean I'm, I see the board is at a strategic kind of a level, and uh, we have our schools that are sort of at this tactical level, but we have we have these advisory council folks that have a, a real sincere interest in seeing the disaggregated data, and there's this reoccurring theme that you're hearing from board members about individual schools and certain information about individual schools while understandably protecting the, the, the private, the information that should remain confidential about individual students. So as I'm talking with you, what, what sort of, I mean, are you, just gonna, are you saying, I mean, what, you, what is your vision if, you, you know, if you're there yet as to what access to disaggregated data would be available to our advisory councils? So in the dashboard that went public today, there's the capacity to disaggregate mm -hmm. the data in several ways. So you can, uh, again, the public dashboard, I can disaggregate it um, you know, by gender, by race, by the language of the respondent. As we uh, display additional data, much like when we report out on the graduation rate, we certainly report out in a disaggregated fashion based on ethnicity, based on service. Uh, does somebody qualify for a free and reduced price lunch? Uh, are they uh, someone who's an English language learner? Uh, is it a special ed student? We, we disaggregate the, the data. And so there's every intention as we put forward that data that um, members of the community would have that capacity. Now the balancing point with that and the one that you have to tuck in the back of your head is that some of those service groups or some of those subgroups when you disaggregate become very small at a building level. 
And if I get down below 10 students, mm, now, I'm, now I'm identifying groups of kids in a way that I can identify individual students. So the, the, the push and pull on this is, yes, we want to provide disaggregated data, but at a certain point, you're not going to be able to see that because we're protecting the privacy of those students when those subsets of kids get below 10. One last question with regard 10, to actually 10 or less. One, one additional question with regard to our advisory councils. W what mechanism will they have, uh, if any, and it may just it may be through what the maybe through board members, to provide input back about the dashboards and how they're configured, if there's. Uh, some, I mean, obviously one can conduct one search through a drop-down screen as you, as you sort of demonstrated here, but if there's some additional focus or attention, how, does, how is that articulated to you all? I mean, I, I don't mind folks talking to me and saying, hey, can you get all of them and say da-da-da, but um, I wanted to find out whether you, you know, what sort of feedback loop you were envisioning for the dashboards. Well, so. What I was going to say as well, that we do, for instance, we just, um, Dr. Cuellar and I just had a conversation with um, the leadership of the PTA Council. Where, um, where we can, we want to make sure that we have some staff representation so that we can hear directly back from our advisory, um, from the advisory council. Certainly they are the board's advisory councils. So they can certainly come and share how things are working for them. But in terms of how this, this is so new and being launched today, we can certainly make sure that staff will be available at, at a meeting so that we can get information back on how it's working, that type of uh, qualitative information from them. Thanks, Rolita. Sure. Um, I did want to ask you if I could back on you know this technical and then the strategic, the the governance level from a strategic viewpoint. Uh, it's like a reoccurring motif, and it reaches back to an earlier time when there was a sense that of all the resources that are allocated towards education, there still are regions in our county that somehow are not. Uh, at the same place in line to receive resources. And that's why when I saw the, the, the oval that said finance, and I heard Mr. Stewart specifically ask, and I was saying to June, hey, look, June, it's right here on this screen, and then, of course, he commented. Um, it is the idea that now through these dashboard, through, through the dashboard um, approach, one can very readily see where we are allocating our dollars in the different areas of our county. And as someone who came from an area of the county where the, re the, re the, the, the often expressed comment, and you have heard me say it when we were looking at um, the, the Victory Villa boundary study in, 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 the, in the neighborhoods, the sense that dollars were not finding their way to a particular area. We have a, we're fortunate to have a superintendent who was, was an assistant principal and a principal in that area. That does not mean that she is not concerned about other places, don't get me wrong, but that was one of the things that, that you know, stood out to me is that I, I know now there's someone who, who's familiar with the area, a large portion of which is in our sixth district. And I like the idea of being able to look at a glance at a dashboard and see where these dollars are going. And you know, when we had folks commenting about the need for new high schools in certain areas of our county, which certainly is you know, their right to advocate for, they were making a very similar argument. Now, without getting into the, the merits of the, of, the, of the argument about how far we should look back, et cetera, I heard what they were saying. Of course, I was hearing it a little bit differently. But what I wanted to find out is what is over the horizon with regard to finance, because that helps inform board members, whether it be current board members or over the horizon board members, about the allocation of dollars. And, and you know, the numbers tell a tale or they write a different narrative from what everyone may have believed and may simply not be accurate. So uh, specifically to the, the example that you gave, I believe that the release of um, the students count uh, data in a dashboard format will enable communities to uh, very readily see um, where needs are in terms of seats. Um, and it will be an interactive environment where folks can look at those, those needs across, across the community. In terms of finance, and, and I'm just going to re-articulate re the point I, I, I did earlier, um, I am not opposed to moving forward w with a finance dashboard. Matter of fact, it was part of 
my early thinking. Initially, uh, though, when we started to dig into that, we are getting ready to have an update in our, our finance system, which means that the, the way the data is stored and it's communicated from one system to another for the purposes of dashboarding would a actually have to be done twice. We'd have to do it for the old system, and then we'd have to redo it all for the new system because the data structure won't be the same. So I've put a pin in that for the time being because we really need to have the update for the finance system first, and then we'll build dashboards off of it following. It is part of the roadmap, but it's contingent on having the finance system updated first. I note today's date is December 19th. And I note over the weekend there were a number of plays made <laughs> during football games and officials made calls and then somebody had to contact the folks up in New York who <laughs> using a different set of data had to then, uh, you know, make, make decisions and then relay what was, to, what was to be. What I'm trying to get a sense for is what timetable. I, I don't have that. We can get back with that. Um, one of the things that I said um, during the retreat, and I would just reiterate it, um, there are times and places for dashboards, and there are also um, ways that data can be, needs can be met through reports as well. And, and so I think there's a balance here sometimes between what should be in a dashboard and what should be in a report. Um, again, we erred initially on trying to provide those things that change in the dashboard, things that you don't have access to already. And we've provided supplements in terms of reports for the things that you already have. But we put them in all in one place. Um, I hear the question around uh, finance, and I think that's worthy of a... Yeah, I was going to say that... Um, it, thank you, Mr. Birch, for that question. What I think you're asking for is this kind of that sequence of when we're looking to turn over the uh, financial system and then when that build-out date would come. Just let me get with the team mm -hmm. so that we can then get that information to you in terms of that timeline. I think that's what you're asking for, that's so a, that reasonably that, yeah. you'll know when to expect it. That's a, that's a, that, that's a fair answer. One last point. Our operating budget is about $1.5 billion. And as I, as I think about that, um, when we look at what is unspent at the end of the year, it may be in the range, and George Saris <laughs> probably has a better feel for this, but it's something in around 14 to $15 million. And that percent of the $1.5 billion is extraordinarily small. But in terms of $14 million and what that could do for disabled access in our schools is not to be minimized. And, that, and that's the last point that I'll make. Thanks. Mr. Hayden, do you have any questions? No, I'm just talking. Very good. Mrs. Eaton, do you have? <laughs> Very good. We're getting close to the point where, where we're almost to the finish line. Mrs. Causey. You missed my joke, sorry about that. It was funny, everyone just laughed, okay. All right, um, first I do wanna say thank you um, to the team to for working on this and thank you to Mrs. White, our interim superintendent, for um, putting the focus on um, meeting um, the conversations that we had in the board retreat in terms of the board being interested in um, making better decisions and needing um, more relevant data um, presented in a fashion that's helpful and timely. So this does meet that, and uh, I just appreciate the work um, knowing that a lot does go into this. And <clears throat> kind of going back to um, dovetail with Mr. Virch for a moment about our legacy systems. So you're bringing in data, you said currently it's two to three years. So that's all current. Um, where, what is being pulled, if anything, from the data warehouse that we've had maybe 15 years? I don't know. And if so, you could just talk about the legacy just for a so, brief time. So the internal dashboards uh, um, and the, the legacy data warehouse are really one and the same. Uh, the dashboards are, in effect, a skin to what's within the, the data warehouse. Um, you know, again, that was a wonderful building block uh, to start with. And initially, there were lots of individual reports that existed within that, some of which were somewhat contradictory, to be perfectly blunt, because they queried the data in slightly different fashions. So 
one of the other things that's sort of a guiding principle under this is this idea of one version of the truth, that, that however, you know, if I look at it from this building or if I aggregate it this way, I'm always looking at the data in a similar fashion through a dashboard. Uh, but that data warehouse is the framework under that. Now, there are some limits to what that warehouse can do in terms of continuity of data over time because uh, not all the data is the same. There are things that change in terms of how uh, data is operationally de defined, how it's measured. Um, you know, going from MSA to PARC is a good example. Those, you know, it's apples and oranges. So putting all that data into a dashboard uh, would produce some nonsensical comparisons, to be perfectly honest. So um, the data really, again, focuses on what's actionable and what's most current with meaningful uh, historical comparisons. So in the case that I gave with the two to three year timeline, the stakeholder data, the stakeholder survey's been in place for three years. That is a reasonable window for me then to have that historical data because it's the same ruler the in, uh, entire time. And we report out the same way on it. Um, that's part of the design thinking around that. But this is our historical data warehouse that we have built all these things upon. Okay, great. So in terms of the data structure, and the system, unlike the financial aspect, we, we do have this sturdy structure and this warehouse of data that the system has been using for, I think it's 15 years, is that close? Pretty close. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the other thing I was um, curious about is, um, if you mentioned it, I missed it, graduation rates, are those going to be anywhere on the dashboard for board members? Yes, they are. Okay, and that's gonna be? It's a be, tab. It's a tab, okay. And uh, within that graduation rates, is there a way to distinguish between our students that are meeting all of the requirements of graduation and some of our students are on an alternate path um, or may finish one or two requirements in an alternate way? Is that, there? That's not part of the, the current dashboard. Okay, um, because again, we're looking at understanding the usefulness of programs, what are the uh, systems that are helping some of our students cross the finish line, if you will, to continue with the football metaphor. Um, and if they're being helpful, maybe we want to allocate more resources to them. Also, if they're being helpful, we may want to mainstream some components of those programs, whether it's a bridge or some of the other programs that are used to help our students. Um, also, in terms of um, talking, dovetailing with Steve, with some of our special populations, um, and we also heard from one of our stakeholders tonight around dyslexic students and um, Orton Gillingham and the success rates in terms of understanding how specific programs may be helping students, either those with a specific need like dyslexic or whether they have some other reason that they're struggling readers and that program helps. Again, in order to make decisions of where should we expand programs more rapidly or maybe diminish programs that aren't having results? Is there a space or a time where you're thinking about those sorts of programs? So can we divide and conquer on that first? For a yes. <laughs> um, in terms of programs and program evaluation, um, my team does that. So um, I think that when you're trying to do a, a program evaluation, it's important to have a um, a structure around that, uh, a model for doing that evaluation, um, where you've operationalized the terms, how you're gonna measure it, et cetera, uh, have some sense of what fidelity is. These are things that um, are really not the place of a dashboard. Uh, that, that's the purpose of a program evaluation and the generation of a program evaluation report. And for those um, programs, uh, large-scale programs across the system, um, you've seen where we've invested in external evaluations. We've also done internal evaluations around those. And I think that's the appropriate vehicle when we're trying to really understand the impact of a program uh, separate from other, other things. That, that's the best vehicle for that. Uh, going back to graduation and really understanding that, um, you know, I think there's a good story around that. And, you know, I actually spent some time a little while back talking with Mr. Stewart and, uh, and Mr. McDaniels around that. Um, the dashboards and the school reports have really supported the changes in our graduation rate. 
And I think uh, Dr. Cuellar can speak to that directly in terms of what that looks like at a building level and with our teams. And we, use, we utilize that data to kind of drive uh, what that work looks like at the ground level and um, how we support schools, initially principals and graduation teams, and um, um, how we're focusing on all levels of students and groups of students and ensuring that um, you know, we look at students, especially students that are on the bubble, you know, how are we providing specific supports and resources to those, to those children. Um, we look at our students that are significantly behind as well as our students that are on or advanced. Um, we, do have, um, we do have graduation teams that are in place um, in each of our buildings. Uh, and these are also something that um, we do at the community superintendent level as well. We actually engage in these um, project graduation meetings um, where we, we are allowed to do deep dives with the school leadership teams uh, around where we are with the specific data. You know, what, what, um, what is the data showing us specific to these, to these students? Attendance, discipline, um, uh, grades. And grades is a, is a huge indicator in terms of a student who's going to be able to graduate on time with their peers or not. Um, and we look at um, a myriad of also the college and career ready, uh, college and career, uh, career ready standards as well, you know, which is PSAT, SAT, AP enrollment, AP performance. Um, and those are conversations that we are having all the time. Um, and uh, our, our school leadership teams have been doing that work um, for a very long time here in BCPS. To be honest with you, too, um, and not just tooting the horn, but you know, I've worked in several places around the country specifically, and BCPS is probably one of the best systems that I've seen in terms of um, um, what type of practices that they have in place um, to make sure that we're not only supporting kids, but we're capturing kids early. And we're making sure we're putting interventions in place to support them moving forward to graduation. So I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. And we're always expanding, on the, we're always expanding the work as well to keep getting better at what we do to support kids. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions I had is um, dashboard, I guess, is the, is the, the, um, the way that we're moving forward, MSDE has um, several dashboards that they've um, that they've launched recently. Um, Dr. Salmon uh, was at the MABE conference in September, October, and uh, she was talking about the different resources that they have available to help the local education agencies. So um, I had gone and looked um, because I've used different um, information that they have on the MSDE website, and they have. Um, a achievement um, dashboard that's related specifically moving forward on the park test. Um, and they call it the, well, it, part of it is the Pearson Access Next, and it has um, individual student data, district level performance data, school level data, data management reporting systems. Um, so individual, district level, school level, state level. Um, so I'm curious. If you all, how much have you all looked at this, and um, is that something where, like the um, Maryland report card, where there's going to be a link? Is there going to be a link to to this aspect of the um, state dashboard? No, there won't be. Um, <laughs> just a, that that tool, as you mentioned, has individual student data, and it requires a login to get in too. So while that is a tool and a resource that uh, we certainly would expect our teachers and staff to be using, uh, and our curriculum office is certainly using, uh, it, it would not be appropriate for us to give access because we'd be giving access to individual student data. On the other hand, um, you know, when we build out park dashboards for the system, uh, you know, people in the community will have access and ability to disaggregate the data. Um, in ways that'll look a little different than what you see on, on MSDE's uh, report card, um, and will maybe reflect uh, some of the best practices we've seen in large systems around the country. There, there are several large systems around the country that really have some nice data, interactive data reporting tools uh, where community can have access to the level of information uh, around uh, park performance um, that's appropriate without exposing student information uh, in a way. Well, Much like, you know, we have that data in our warehouse. Again, the, the public dashboards are set up in a database that is uh, completely outside our firewall so that there is no way that it's possible for a person to connect from that external data back to our internal data within our firewall. I, I, I can't underscore how important I think it is to protect student privacy in these systems. 
So I guess one of the things that I was um, thinking about in terms of our, the board, not the public, um, looking at information is to understand where we are as a system within our state. Because we're in a state where there's statewide focus on education, there's statewide funding for education. Um, so in terms of evaluating where we are and how we're doing and maybe looking at um, where we can look at some other um, LEAs for best practices around certain areas, um, that to have that comparison within the state um, would be helpful. So um, I'm curious, is that something that you can incorporate for board members in terms of utilizing that data? The state it, it, comparison that's data. Not something right now that um, I'm prepared to answer. I, I'd need to, to reflect on that and get back with the superintendent. Yeah, again, so again, in terms of the list of the priorities, I just want to restate Dr. Brown's point, and that is that we're trying to make sure that there's uh, data available that's closest to the student data, particularly um, for our teachers and administrators, and then also making sure that the board has access to um, the buildings, right, that are in, within our um, school system. So in terms of your governance, governance and decision making that you have the information um, that's available to you, certainly MSDE has information that is, like you said, that is readily available. So should you need to disaggregate and look at where we are by system, there's, there's an, uh, an avenue for that to happen. But in terms of this build out, our priorities have been to look at that student data, ensuring student data privacy, making sure that you have the information available to you, um, and one single access point. Um, so that you don't have to go searching around everywhere. So again, that was our um, mission. That's what we set out to do based on the uh, requirements and based on some of the asks uh, this summer, this uh, July. And so I'm just I'm re really pleased with our team for coming together to make a lot of this uh, information accessible to you. This has been accelerated, as you can imagine. This doesn't just happen. So. As these two gentlemen sit before me, of course I want to thank them, and especially um, research accountability and assessment, but also our Office of Information Technology. Again, as you can imagine, a dashboard like this does, doesn't just happen. So there's a lot of programming, there's a lot of, in terms of data input and manipulation that has to then occur to make it happen. And so our teams have really worked together. Again, we are in the very early stages of this, but according a couple of slides back, we have some of our key priorities um, that's really based on student achievement, student counts, enrollment data, those kinds of things that, we've, um, that we have prioritized above and beyond. Um, and then again, we, again, that doesn't negate the fact that you have the ability then to go into to use um, Maryland's resources, MSD's resources, to look at rankings and those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, just to go back, you had said that there are um, some of our staff that are using the MSDE website in curriculum and instruction. So have some of our staff um, been trained on it? They've provided train. MSDE has provided training on their dashboard. Yes, there are a number of people have used it. Well, we've always used um, the information um, that's available, um, you know, from Maryland Report Card to various uh, data over the years. Um, and so that isn't anything that's new to our central office administrators or to our school-based administrators as well. Um, there are years past, we used to use that data in order to compare. As a principal, I would be able to compare my school to schools that were like mine. So again, that that's something that our, our administrators are very familiar with already. Okay, so it, so it is, um, because one of the other aspects in terms of using our resources and timeliness in terms of developing the dashboard is if MSDE has a component that's already up and running and it's something that we could provide the link to the principals to, to use already, either while ours is in development or to look at it as a template for what we might build and it could save resources in that way and save time in that way. It, have you have have you looked at it or in that way, or is that something that you could look at? Because as we're doing software development and interactions and so forth, they also have a really lovely chart the way they show 
right. the success rate. And again, that's something yeah. that our staff is already familiar with. Our principals are familiar, our central office is already familiar with that, um, that information that's readily available by MSDE. So, so how do principals get logins? Is that something that has to come from you or they go to MSDE to get it? Because I, because you do need a login. Because I tried to get in, but I can't. So um, let me back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Number one, I'm never a fan of double work. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and certainly as we've developed these tools, um, we've looked across not only Maryland but the entire country. We've looked mm -hmm. at, at dashboarding tools that have been developed in, in some of the larger systems across the country. Um, you know always willing to, to learn and, and, and build upon uh, the ideas that others have already done. Double work's never fun. In terms of access, um, you know, that's immediated access. I don't recall exactly how that's done, um, but, you know, that is something that is supported. And I know that we recently provided training to all our principals in terms of what, what data do we use when, uh, in terms of evaluating not only uh, our enacted curriculum at a building, but our enacted curriculum system-wide. And that is one of the tools that, that was described in that process. So our, so our educators have access to it, the ones that would be appropriate? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Uelfelder, do you? Thank you. Um, for, first of all, I want to thank you and your staff for what you have produced for us. Um, it, it seems to me that, that so many people criticize uh, our system uh, going into a downspin and this, that, and the other thing, and yet here, here's a presentation that you made to me shows a tremendous amount of skill, a tremendous amount of time, and certainly listening to what the board has said. Sorry. And stay on. And, and listening to the board has said. And just for a moment, I want to I want to point out in tonight's agenda, uh, we have the, not only this report, but we have the minority and small business report, and we have the third party billing. And, and I just mentioned that because it, it shows other parts of our educational system here in Baltimore County that that we have to provide either by law or because it makes good business sense to provide these things. And so. And times when we criticize so much, let's step back a minute and let's talk about what we have in front of us tonight and how we all should be very, very proud of it. Um, two things. Number one, I'll make a real fast remark. Let's don't be hogs. Uh, they have spent a lot of time on developing what you have in front of you, and it's certainly a great deal more than we had yesterday. So let's, let's believe in, in the leadership that they will provide what is necessary. You know, data is interesting. It's called relevant data and irrelevant data. And we want to make sure we don't spend a lot of time and effort on irrelevant data, because irrelevant data is misused all the time. I just want to be careful that, that we have that. And I just have one question. Um, in, in several of the slides, uh, you said that uh, individuals had to uh, sign acceptable use agreements. Does that, shouldn't that provide, shouldn't that also be what we should do as individuals? all the way up and down the line for everybody on the other side of the firewall? Well, I didn't see it in the slides, but I certainly would expect that you'd ask me to sign an appropriate uh, use agreement. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Dr. Brown, Dr. Cuellar, thank you very much. This has been a, uh, you, a great discussion, a great opportunity for the board to uh, hear from you. Uh, it was so good that we blew right through all the rest of our time allocation for the meeting. The only thing between our board's winter break um, between now and our board's winter break is committee updates. And um, we'll do those swiftly. Audit committee. Uh, the last meeting uh, was actually, um, uh, we suspended that meeting as we didn't have anything relevant. Actually, one of the things that we were going to discuss is the third party billing. I've read this report, and uh, I think it's just uh, amazing that their system uh, accounts for a little over $7 million in reimburse, reimbursable money uh, from uh, the federal government, and they've done a good job of it. I'm very proud of them. Thank you. Building and contracts. No. Uh, curriculum. Uh, we, thank you. Our last curriculum meeting was on December 14th. Um, we had a very informative presentation 
uh, on understanding dyslexia, as Ms. Hemling pointed out earlier this evening. And that uh, type of program about interventions is going to be an ongoing theme with our curriculum uh, meeting. When we had our um, student achievement presentation in September, we were presented with a number of groups in our student population that are struggling, like our, uh, our struggling readers, and we have certain uh, groups, our English language learners. And with Dr. McComas, we're, we're getting information about how we intervene with these um, struggling groups so that we have continuous improvement in our system and we are addressing those gaps and needs that we have. Um, we also had a presentation uh, about our support services. We got a, a definition of what counselors do, the social workers, the psych psychological services, PPW people, and health services. So that was very informative, um, along with some other topics. But um, it was very informative, and um, our next meeting is January 18th. Thank you. Digital safety. Yes, very briefly, the SIT committee met for its <coughs> quarterly meeting last Wednesday, and the team is doing great work moving forward on the redesign plan for the Growing Up Digital site and also um, working on a data breach communication plan, which uh, I think is very important. Uh, we're still uh, working on um, improving communications, and, uh, and they will be giving us uh, sort of midway <coughs> updates since we only meet every three months, so that they'll be providing information uh, midway through. So if anyone, any uh, members of the public have questions or concerns that they would like to have brought before the Safety and Technology Committee, please let me know. Policy review. Thank you, Ed. Um, on behalf of the members of our Policy Review Committee, a um, happy root beer holiday to everyone. Um, I would also <laughs> like to uh, share with folks that the policies presented for first reader on tonight's agenda will be available for comment on our school systems policy website. Members of the public are encouraged to submit their comments to these policies on our website. Members of the board are also most welcome to use the website. Uh, members of the public are also encouraged to visit the policy webpage, http colon backslash backslash www.bcp.org backslash system backslash policies underline rules backslash. The webpage not only contains a link to policies currently available for public comment, but it also includes a link to the Policy Review Committee's most important editing conventions. The Policy Review Committee met on December 11th. The policy recommended for first reading at the December 11th meeting will be on the board's January 23rd, 2018 agenda. I'm supposed to say Happy New Year. And the committee's next meeting will be February 12th. Thank you all so much. All right, Josie, there are three more days of school. Um, yes. Then winter break. Schools will resume on January 2nd. Uh, the next board meeting is January 9th. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, we're adjourned.